All right, let's briefly pick up the, uh, there are some slides at the end of the last section that, that we, we passed over, that I passed over. Um, this is somewhat applicable because we're, we're talking about measuring strain due to heat in this slide. And what we get into in the heat stress section next is um, how we can measure different temperatures in the body um, to approximate stress. So this uses the information that we're going to talk about shortly. These are um, temperatures, specifically rectal temperatures. How much has your temperature increased compared to what we think the upper limit should be, 39.5? Again, a conservative upper limit. We saw some people went to 40 degrees in that um, one comparison of highly fit individuals. And then comparing that to how high your... Um, your heart rate is increased versus an upper limit, a theoretical upper limit of 180. And so if you increased, um, if your core temperature is 39 or above, you end up scoring five points for that half. If it's 180 or above, you score five points for the second half. The PSI, physiological strain index, is at a 10. And we can see what that looks like in this example. So a physiological strain index of 10 was not really, it's not observed uh, in these individuals, 100 subjects exposed to 120 minutes of heat stress. And this is meant to just give you a sense of what a number on that physiological strain scale means, what it represents. And so if we are at rest with a relatively normal heart rate and a relatively normal core temperature, our PSI is zero, right? That should make sense. There's no physiological strain. Specifically, there's no heat strain. And then as those values respond to sitting, this is 120 minutes of passive heat stress, to sitting in the heat, core temperature goes up, heart rate goes up. And let's look at a moderate PSI, a moderate strain, 38 degrees, core temperature, 140 beats per minute. It's like moderate exercise. Yeah, this is sitting for two hours in 120, uh, <coughs> sorry, sitting for two hours in the heat. Um, you can see what the heat is down here, by the way, 40 degrees, 40%. Now, over those two hours, no one ended up at a, uh, a PSI of 10, which I suppose is good. You can imagine what that would, what that would uh, be like or what values would characterize that high of a, uh, of a PSI. If we had reached 39.5, which we didn't, and if we had reached 180 beats per minute, which we didn't, that would characterize a PSI of 10. The highest response to two hours sitting in the heat, 175 beats per minute, 38.7 degrees Celsius core temperature, exhibited by one individual. Only one individual responded that much. And really, if you think about it that way, this is the most susceptible individual, right? All of these people sat for two hours in the heat. Some people only showed nominal increases. Some showed large increases, enhancing the variability in um, potential responses to, uh, to heat stress. Now, the risk of uh, going off on too much of a tangent, there is a similar strain scale for cold stress. This doesn't incorporate a value for heart rate because the heart rate doesn't typically spike with typical cold stress. In response to uh, immersion, like a marine accident, there is a large stress signal that accelerates and causes a heart rate spike. But in normal cold, we don't see this typical acceleration of heart rate. We see changes in the core temperature primarily. So now we're comparing core temperature to the change in skin temperature and how that uh, impacts what we call cold strain. Now we'll, we'll look at measuring both of these shortly. 
And I want you to just note the relative contribution of each of these values. Two-thirds of the number is based on the change in core temperature. If it's less than 35, that's bad. If it's 35, that's extreme stress. And one-third is due to the change in skin temperature. Skin is a lot more variable. It's generally a temperature that we allow to fall faster or further. And uh, it doesn't affect vital organ function as much as core temperature does. So we think of core temperature as being the more important temp. And I don't have a nice table to show you the cold strain index, but you can imagine a 10 would be core temperature of 35, skin temperature of 20, down from 37 and maybe 25 to 27, respectively. Now, I did include at the end of the last section, this is um, a bit of a thought exploration, a bit of a heavier topic, and I suppose it's not the worst thing to include it here. And maybe we end with it because it's, it's sort of unfortunate, but we don't know what the actual exposure limits are. We say 39.5 degrees as a cutoff to prevent people from experiencing heat injury or developing a heat injury. Hyperthermia, 39.5 or 40 degrees, those are somewhat flexible uh, thresholds, but certainly above those levels are not something that we can study in um, uh, accidents, situations lost in the desert or, or severe accidents. We have monitored or, or registered temperatures over, 41 de or over 40, 41 degrees but we don't ever make those happen in the lab because there's too much liability. So we say that the upper limit is 40 degrees. And similarly, the lower limit we say is 35 degrees because we don't invoke that in research, in the lab, and we know there's severe consequences of your core temperature falling below 35. Although like with hyperthermia, there are incidents where we've measured. We've recorded values lower than that. And um, that reminded me, I, I can't remember, if, I think it was a BBC documentary. They have um, a great program called Horizon that talks about all the new latest scientific innovations. And one of them was cryotherapy and being able to put someone in stasis or lower their body temperature to help facilitate surgery. And I think somebody was trapped in the ice might have been like a plane crash or a skiing accident, and they had a core temperature of 31 degrees. They were there for half an hour or something, and they still survived. And now they're trying to use that as a technique to facilitate open heart surgery or um, during really long surgeries that are somewhat difficult to use this, this idea of cryotherapy to help increase the uh, potential outcomes. But we won't do this in lab. Um, we have a bit more information from a really uh, unfortunate period in history. Uh, the Nazis did study a lot of this type of work, specifically in their efforts to uh, invade and fight in Russia, where it was very, very cold. And so they would often test individuals, the limits of individuals, um, to see to, to, to improve their, their warfighter survival. So prisoners were exposed in these situations to life-threatening hazards so they could better understand combat ability. And maybe what the limits of exposure were. And I'd like to say that recovery from was a priority, but I really don't think that's the case, as evidenced by some of the numbers that have uh, held out or that we've, we've recovered from that type of work. And so these are records of attempts with actual people to lower core temperature to their extremes and observe the response, observe what the extreme would be. How cold can a person get before losing function and dying? And the various um, immersions are all quite cold. Four or five degrees is as cold as you would ever get for any even immersion protocol that we, we discuss now. But four or five degrees is, is um, the immersion uh, temperature. Uh, 
and you can see what the body temperatures of these individual individual subjects were upon removal. So we say 35 is the lower limit. We've seen marine accidents with 33 degrees Celsius, but these are observations of 27.7 degrees Celsius. 26.7 degrees Celsius. And in most cases, these subjects are still alive, which is shocking. In some cases, they're not. For instance, this, this first individual, 27.7, was in this five degree water for over an hour, at which point they died. And they died at 27.7. But look at this variability, this third individual, identical core temperature, was removed after an hour and a half, survived. How, how is that possible? And we don't have the answer, and we will never have the answer. We shouldn't have that answer. But it's a remarkable difference. Some people even started to rewarm. Or, no, sorry. Some people lasted longer after their removal. They continued to cool, but this was a point where um, their core temperature couldn't be recovered. And I don't imagine that there were many fail-safes or attempts in place to try to rewarm the individual using warm air or blankets or, or much, um, much of anything. A really uh, unfortunate data set that we have due to some pretty terrible... Um, Unfortunately, what's called science at the time. So, so this, is, this is a really poor uh, tangent to leave class on. And this is what uh, spurred the, uh, the, not the, uh, the Nuremberg Code. At this point, there were no um, stipulations for scientists. And so in, in the doctor's trials, which is what's shown here at the end of World War II, um, the doctors that undertook this kind of work argued that there was um, there were no rules forbidding that type of um, data collection, that type of science. So it wasn't technically illegal. They were just following orders. Um, so we established at the uh, the Declaration for Helsinki the uh, the Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg Code, which adheres to 10 basic principles that we still work by now. And we put this in grant applications, and you see it in papers, and ethics review boards all adhere to these principles. The Nuremberg Code shown here. This is the paper from the actual, or the page from the actual paper, um, which boils down basically to you need consent. Before this code, there was no consent. And I know I didn't include this in the slides that you have on Moodle. And if this is uh, of interest to you, by all means, take notes. I'm not going to ask you questions about it. I think it's just um, maybe to provide context or a bit of gravity to the situation. But it's not something that, uh, that we will come back to very much. So the code requires voluntary consent, which wasn't, um, wasn't uh, laid out at the time. That's why prisoners could be used as experimental subjects. Uh, the code requires that all attempts be made to avoid unnecessary pain and suffering, and even discomfort. So going too long without food is one that will come, come across. If, if you're doing a fasting trial, that's discomfort, not allowed. Um, being in a really hot environment, discomfort, not allowed. Certainly unnecessary pain and suffering, you saw in the last slide, that's an absolute requirement now for all human ethics research. Um, laying out your plan for the study, there has to be a belief that the experiment will be tolerated by the individual. And depending on the question, maybe not even well tolerated, but that they can survive and there's no permanent injury and death will not result from whatever your intervention happens to be. Or if there is the risk of a disability or something dangerous happening, that it's 
the lesser of two evils. The person will die if nothing happens, but we have this ability to try an experimental surgery. It may end up in death or disability, but it's a better outcome than leaving them alone. So there are 10 points. I've boiled them down into three main ones here, and uh, you can easily find the Nuremberg Code online if that's something that you are interested in reading. But boy, or um, born out of that turmoil was um, something that we still use today, which is really remarkable that it wasn't in place at the time, thinking back. So that's it for the end of those slides. Um, I did have a summary slide. Yeah, I should probably go through this just because I don't think I put that in your, your slide set. 37 degrees, we know that's a temperature that we like to maintain. We are talking about in this section how we regulate around 37 degrees Celsius. Sweat, shiver, we can shunt blood back and forth. It's not meant to make sense yet. We don't know why this allows us to regulate at 37 degrees, but these are some of the, uh, the ways that we can maintain body temperature. Um, body temperature is all based on gradients. Heat balance, heat flow is a gradient. If there is more heat outside than inside, heat will flow from outside to inside and your body gets hotter. Heat balance dictated by gradients. Uh, we didn't talk about clothing, but clothing can capture and modify the, the microenvironment. It can limit convection, it can limit conduction, and this is not so important because we didn't talk about that section. Being that everything is gradients, we can move or change the factors in the heat balance equation, and it's probably flow that is the controlled variable. We talked about some models for body temperature control. Flow is likely the controlled variable. But throughout all of this, our limits, our ethical regulations, everything is very conservative. We like to think that we're, we're a bit more advanced and um, enlightened than previous forays into this, this type of work. Everything's very conservative. Wind chill index, physiological strain index, the values are all very conservative so as to identify people at risk before they are at risk or prevent any serious damage from happening before it's too late. So that was a somewhat longer aside or tangent than I was hoping for, but that's the end of the um, series on general thermoregulation. We can get back to a happier topic now. Oh, no. I jumped ahead. Happier topic. Batman and Robin, certainly happy. Happier topic. How body temperature changes the physiological response to thermal signals. First, what are the thermal signals? So, Anything that we try to do, any response that the body uh, exhibits is graded. It's proportional to the discrepancy. It's proportional to the stress. If you are really hot, we mobilize everything to cool the body quickly. If you're slightly hot, less of a concern. But the discrepancy from homeostasis drives how much we try to cool the body. If we're at 39 degrees, we cool it a lot. If we're at 37.5, we don't really care. What is hot? This idea of core temperature is an obvious variable that we want to control. Maybe it's a value. Maybe there's a threshold. Maybe it's how quickly it's increasing or how quickly it's decreasing. But the core seems to be of primary importance. It's an obvious thermoregulatory stimulus. This is one thing that initiates the response by the body to start to cool. But it's not the only thing. Core temperature is probably, if we had to pick one, it would be the variable that the mechanisms respond to. 
but skin temperature can modify the normal cooling response. And this, this sort of gets at the idea that heat flow is probably the regulated variable because if you take core and skin, we're really describing the movement between those two points from the internal organs to the periphery. If the skin can modify the thermoregulatory response, that is, if the gradient between the inside and the outside of the body is larger or smaller, that really implies that is how quickly heat can move away from the core of the body, how quickly the gradient um, will, will suck heat away from the core, or how, how quickly heat will flow away from the core. So I'll show you what I mean by um, skin temperature modifying the thermoregulatory response. In all of this, we're trying to figure out how to best measure body temperature. What is body? Do you have millions of electrodes millimeters apart to measure the entire skin surface? Do you try to get probes in any orifice possible? And is there a model to average out body temperature? Is one good enough? We're still trying to figure that out. This is a trace showing uh, core temperature. Here, core temperature is esophageal temperature. And how sweat and skin blood flow respond. And this happens to be sweat on the back. You can measure sweat anywhere. And this happens to be forearm blood flow, and this is often a surrogate used for skin. It's not the entirety of the skin, but we often use this to approximate skin blood flow, or blood flow to the periphery. And so what we want to see here, the first takeaway, is that as core temperature increases, our attempts to thermoregulate increase. As you move to the right along the x-axis, a higher core temperature means a higher sweat rate, means a higher forearm blood flow. That should be obvious. We're not even differentiating the different symbols yet. They both slope up and to the right. With a higher temperature, you have a higher sweat rate. With a higher temperature, you have a higher forearm blood flow. So there's a clear response to core temperature that can be modified by the skin temperature. And let's look just at sweat rate on the left quickly. Here we're differ uh, differentiating between a higher temperature. The closed circles are a skin temperature of 34-ish degrees, which is quite hot. And the open circles are 27.9, 28 degrees, which is normal. It's cool in here, you measured skin temperature, it might be 25, a bit lower than normal. And this says, if skin temperature is higher, then sweating starts sooner and it increases faster. Overall, there is more urgency to sweat. So it starts sooner, instead of starting at 37, it starts at 36.6 or 36.7. You start to sweat sooner. And then it increases faster. The slope of this line is steep. It's steeper than the line on the right. So for any given degree increase in core temperature, you have a higher sweat rate if your skin temperature is also higher. Which makes sense because more of your body is hot. There is a larger stimulus to lose that heat, to avoid becoming hyperthermic, and we're trying to mobilize one of our thermoregulatory mechanisms, sweating, to do that. On the right-hand side, with a higher skin temperature, blood flow is higher for a given core temperature. So there isn't a difference in the response. That is, um, the sensitivity of this response. The lines are parallel in this case. They're shifted up or they're shifted to the left. So with a higher skin temperature, you get 
uh, blood flow to the skin earlier. But regardless, at any given core temperature, you have more blood flowing to the skin. So the skin's hotter at any given core, uh, core temperature. There's more blood flow to the skin. And that's simply because the skin is where heat is lost. And blood transports heat to be lost. For any core temperature, you have a higher blood flow to the skin with uh, skin temperature also being higher. And you can see again, closed circles, higher skin temp, open circles, lower skin temp. So there is an inherent relationship and core temperature, uh, a small change in core temperature makes for a large change in foreign blood flow or a large change in sweat rate. And that remains the same, but is modified slightly by the influence of a warmer skin temp. So let's leave it there for now. We're going to come back and talk about how we measure each of these and which one's more important. You can glean from this graph that it's probably core temperature. There's a much larger response to a change in core temperature than a change in skin. Um, before moving on to talk about the physiological consequences of getting too hot. So we'll, we'll come back to class on Thursday, deal with that stuff, and then carry over through next week.